Good afternoon. I, Mr. Soma Banerjee, head of the Department of English, on behalf of our principal, Dr. Katie Thomas, and management of the college, extend a warm welcome to all the participants to today's one day national webinar on new directions in English literary studies, texts, and contexts hosted by St. Francis de Sales College, Nagpur. I, along with my colleagues, Dr. Sebi Joseph and Mrs. Baljeet Mudliar, will try our best to virtually host and guide you through the proceedings of the day. Let me take this opportunity to briefly introduce my college to you all. SFS College is one of the premier institutions of Nagpur. Established in 1956, the college is a multi-stream institution of higher education. It offers both graduate and postgraduate programs in arts and science. Backed by the vision of our founding fathers and the inspirational leadership of our management and principal, Dr. Katie Thomas, the college has taken steady steps in realizing its mission and vision. Our family of dedicated teachers and creative students make the campus a great learning place where along with academics, debates, symposiums, fests, and sports events provide a wide range of opportunities to grow and excel. The college was graded A by NAC Bengaluru in the third cycle of assessment and accreditation. Friends, English literary studies in the last few decades has undergone a tremendous change. The field that once was solely concerned with a close analysis of texts or the location of a writer in his historical milieu has now opened out to multiple readings and interpretations from a wide range of other disciplines and area studies. A new literary phenomenon is emerging in which the focus on language based theories of the self and the world that has been predominant in the latter half of the previous century is making way for a renewed commitment to the material facts, both of human existence and the universe beyond subjectivity. Just as at the turn of the last century, we had witnessed the convergence of literature with psychology, anthropology, sociology and history, the 21st century too, in its first two decades, has already seen increasing interventions into literary studies from a wide spectrum of interdisciplinary domains. These include, among others, post-humanism, digital humanities, climate change, food studies, disability studies, media theories, cyber culture, and internet technologies. This webinar will deliberate on some of the exciting intersections of theory with literature from the perspectives of cross-cutting areas of inquiry. It seeks to probe into the ways in which our notions of what is a text, how does it function, and what are the many meanings of contexts have undergone a radical change. The current COVID-19 crisis too has given a pandemic turn to the ways in which we think, read, and approach literature. It has made visible the osmotic connections between literature, medicine, and health. The webinar will focus on the changing contours of literary studies and will be especially beneficial for teachers and research scholars. Today, we have with us two eminent scholars who are leading exponents of two important interdisciplinary domains of literary studies, ecocriticism and posthumanism. Both fields have drawn a lot of critical attention in the wake of the current pandemic crisis. The COVID-19 outbreak has brought forth an urgent and rigorous need on our part to examine the complex ways in which climate change, diseases, human bodies, biomedicine and technology are getting increasingly enmeshed in the narratives that define our postmodern subjectivity. Concepts like speciesism, cyborgism, 
are not only adding a new terminology to prevailing knowledge systems, but also making it imperative for us to understand that questions like who we are, what our future will be, can only be answered when we place ourselves in conjunction with all things big and small in the ecosystem of our planet. In the light of this, we will keenly listen to the discourses of today's experts who will have much to offer in their talk on the changing text and context of literary studies. Friends, I would also like to share with you another reason for hosting this webinar. This is with regard to its objectives, one of which was to explore new areas of research. Until a few decades back within the academia, the majority opinion was that research in English studies in India was facing a quiet crisis. Today, the quiet crisis has become so loud and raucous that it can no longer be glossed over. This crisis has been brought about by the production of substandard quality research. As organizers of this webinar, we at SFS College felt that there is an urgent need to take the issue of poor research head on. Through this platform, we wanted to understand and address the problems of research scholars so that research may be pulled out of the morass of academic imbecility. Thus, with the objective of rejuvenating research in literary studies, we are hopeful that today's webinar will provide a new directions to research scholars and students. Our invited speakers with their vast experience in teaching and research will definitely give us new insights in recent trends in literary studies. I am deeply grateful to Dr. Dinesh Kumar Nair from VG Wazi College, Mumbai and Dr. Abdul Muhammad Ali Jinnah from Jamal Muhammad College, Trichy for accepting our invitation. We look forward to their stimulating talks and the interaction with the participants. I'm sure the next couple of hours will turn out to be an intellectual feast with a lot of takeaways for the participants. I welcome our distinguished speakers and all our participants once again to today's national webinar on new directions in English literary studies, texts and contexts. Now, I would like to hand over the proceedings to my colleague, Dr. Sebi Joseph. Dr. Sebi Joseph, please. Thank you, ma'am. It's a it's a privilege to have Dr. Dinesh Kumar Nair as, as Associate Professor, Department of English, VJ Wajay College, Mullet, Mumbai, as our esteemed speaker. He will speak on new directions in English literary studies, texts and context. He will also dwell on the pandemic and bicultural agenda. Dr. Dinesh Kumar Nair has a, a doctoral degree from the University of Mumbai in African American literature, which also happens to be his area of specialization, along with literary theory. He comes equipped with a battery of research articles under his belt. These include uh, literary critical race theory, Mexican fiction, mashup fiction. It would be interesting to, to, to see what this uh, mashup fiction is all about. Chinese uh, research, a paper on Chinese American fiction, though, though Chinese does not belong to the Indo-European family of languages, Dr. Dinesh Kumar Nair has, has a very interesting work on it. His other, his other research articles include trauma studies, masculinity studies, culinary cultural politics, cultural citizenship, Indo-Caribbean writers, migration studies, memory studies, media memory. A note of urgency is reflected in his work on Pakistani women writers, eco-criticism and eco-feminism. His other critical works are spatial criticism, geopolitics, textual democracy, chaos theory, new diasporas, cyber criticism and cultural diplomacy. Dr. Dinesh Nair has presented more than 20 research papers and published articles in international peer-reviewed journals 
such as Atlantic Quarterly, University News, Research Spectrum, Research Drops, European Academic Research, and Virtuoso. He has contributed to critical anthologies on Alice Walker, Amitav Ghosh, G.B. Dasani, Kamala Das, and South Asian literature. World War I, Centenary Hindsights is his reason book. Dr. Dinesh has co-authored and edited three books for the University of Mumbai, Linguistic and Stylistic Analysis of Texts, Translation Studies, and Literary Theory. Dr. Dinesh Nair has acted as a resource person at many national and international conferences. His talks include Foodways and Gustatory Identities in Migration, Emerging Areas of Emerging Areas of Research on American Literature and Culture, Ethnicity in Diaspora, Cultural Capitalism and Indian English Fiction, Toxic Discourse and Watershed Consciousness, Eco-Critical eco Perspectives on the Contemporary Culture, Topo Analysis, Imagine Structure and Leave Spaces in Cultural Texts, Post-Millennial English Fiction in India, a Sociopolitical Overview, South Asian Literature and Cultural Diplomacy, Discursive Psychology and Narrative Psychology in Indian English Fiction, Identities, Cultures, Literary Expression and the Politics of Redefinition, Teaching Literature, Cultural Mediation in the Classroom. It is, it is noteworthy that Dr. Dinesh Nair has, has even a work on the, on the Bard of Avon Street, Shakespeare comes in a new raiment in soundscape, soundscapes in Shakespearean drama. His other talks include cultural context of transformative environmental humanities, literary texts and emerging contexts, ecological multiculturalism, a literary perspective, eco-psychology, a literary perspective and tribal and Indian English fiction. Dr. Dinesh Nair has successfully conduct, conducted a short-term course, Emerging Trends in Literature and Language Studies at SRM University, Sikkim. He has organized a NAC-sponsored NAC national seminar and has completed RUSA's train, train the Trainer Program. Dr. Dinesh Nair has been actively involved in mentoring and training corporate employees of LNT, Infotech, ACT Logistics, and Christ Initiative. We are, we are very lucky to have a person of Dr. Dinesh Kumar Nair's teacher, and I'm sure his, his talk is go going to open the floodgates of future researchers. It will serve as a fillip to many budding, to many, many budding scholars. So, sir, please carry, uh, take on, take on the uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank Set the ball rolling. Thank you. Start sharing. Probably you will have to stop sharing, then only I'll get the first screen. Is the PPT is the slide visible? Can can tell me? Uh, sir, please select screen one. Again, in one in something else. Is it visible now? So click on slideshow.
it visible now? The slide visible. No, sir. You sir, minimize first window. Sir, share share your screen again. In screen one, I am getting not getting the. How is it visible? The screen visible. Screen is visible. Just click on slideshow. Yes, sir. From the from beginning, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Fine. Sorry. Uh, but hello. Uh, yeah. So uh, please, you're not so audible. You have to be a little loud. I don't know. There's a. Am, am I not audible? You're audible, sir, but it's very. Low. Uh, sir, uh, sir, please remove yes. your uh, headphone. Is it without the earphone? Yes, sir. Yes, without sir. Now it's Okay. Is it uh, now audible? Fine enough. Yes, yes sir. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sorry for the uh, the technical glitches. Um, at the outset, uh, let me thank uh, the principal of uh, SFS College, Dr. Katie Thomas, and his very enthusiastic team of very young and vibrant staff members, including. Dr. Shama Banerjee, Dr. Sebi Joseph, and I have been in touch with them in the last uh, uh, five or six days. I could really feel uh, the the cutting edge interest in um, knowledge, knowledge production, and also their commitment uh, to um, humanity studies and uh, the search for a topic. Um, which is very relevant uh, in the days of the pandemic. So uh, I would begin by saying that uh, uh, I would try to fit in my discourse within the larger umbrella term uh, or the title that uh, emerging areas of uh, literature studies, text and context. Um, I'll be taking certain texts definitely, but then they are not strictly literary texts, but I'll be looking at some cultural texts as well. Then I'll be speaking more about the context that has been created by what uh, uh, Dr. Shoma Banerjee has rightly pointed out in her introduction in her concept note as the pandemic term. Some of us have been um, involved actively in benchmarking uh, this very interesting but inevitable turn in uh, studies and in all our academic endeavors, which we could call as the pandemic turn. Has it really happened or is it in the process of happening is what we need to discuss today and in the coming days and then uh, look at uh, and bring new tools in reading existing literature and also analyze the literature that has been literature and other cultural texts that have been produced. Uh, in these three, four months of uh, lockdown, um, as we have been experiencing in the last four or five months, various phases of lockdown and various phases of uh, unlocking and again relocking, um, we have understood, uh, if not many things, we have understood one 
uh, one uh, simple but very 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 significant um, idea that uh, what we call is this new normal um if at if at all it happens in the in the in in the near future or if, whether it is happening already is a debate um this new normal will place us we will place uh, human beings on a terrain of high precarity and a terrain um of high toxicity in many ways and also that terrain will not be germ free and we will also understand quite contrary to what we have been thinking for years and maybe for centuries together um that uh, there is a need to look at a more uh, microscopic realities and i think the pandemic has necessitated that and that is my premise anyway when i'm uh, going to explain the entire topic uh, i'll i'll try and discuss those aspects and then we have also understood or our we are in the process of understanding that we are not germ free or we can say that human beings are not uh, there is a term technical term notobiotic g n o t o notobiotic which means that we are not germ free that we are a, our our uh, self our body our corporeal uh, identity have not been uh, free of germs and there is a new need to understand there is a pressing need to understand how we think about ourselves and our how we think about our immediate environment and also um, most importantly how we reflect all these in our cultural expressions whether it is a it's a play a novel uh, a blog or even Uh, travel writing so uh, i begin with a um, a few visual stimuli stimuli because i i find a lot of uh, immediate reflection of uh, what we talk about in the context of uh, the pandemic in painting so uh, i begin with a few paintings and then slowly get into uh, a bit of a theory uh, on bioculture and biocultural diversity within the larger premise of maybe eco criticism but then uh i'll 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 see to that that uh, these areas are uh, relatively new for us and also they generate more interdisciplinary topics probably for research in future so i begin with a uh, an an upcoming painter um from san francisco and her painting titled um, she has done a series of paintings um, called cell paintings so they are more about cells so Uh, this one was titled healthy cell painting by clary rays rays is uh, is a, as i said excuse is me, a sir. san francisco based uh, painter uh, and excuse she me. uses the uh so uh, your you are on the slide show uh, yeah. you just press uh, from beginning or from current slide because uh, it is not yeah. open yeah okay so what do i need to do <laughs> From so the, you press from the beginning or from current from the, the from beginning, beginning. This, yeah. from the beginning yeah yeah okay yeah. is it moving now is we it moving you can see the third slide uh, no i i've moved on to the second one so you are not able to see uh, so we can yeah now we can see so but uh, like uh sir please uh, stop sharing and uh, share again all right stop sharing and share again yeah just click on share and select screen one option but screen one is not showing that for me screen one is showing um the, the names of Okay now is it uh, visible uh yes just click on uh from the beginning yes okay 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 oh. okay has it come to the yes, second sir. slide second slide yes yes, yes. Yeah. now oh. just min minimize that small window that is oh. uh, right uh, right corner side yeah all right yeah, yeah. thank Sorry. you sir now it is visible yeah yeah fine fine the, now these are the problems of being um, digital migrants no we are not a uh, digital native so we are still uh, um, making uh, our basic efforts in uh, trying to be comfortable with the platform i'm sorry for the the technical problem so i was talking about this uh, peculiar painting 
art, uh, visual art that uh, Clary Ray's uh, specializes. And uh, what she does is uh, she uses the tools and techniques of science in her creative process, implicating that uh, science requires a lot of art and art also requires a lot of input from science. And she draws her inspiration from many biomedical techniques. And that is uh, anyway my area of interest and how um, biocultural art can be uh, in uh, very important in coming days. And also she uses a new media plastic. It's called a media plastic uh, made of epoxy polymer, which is very similar to Rexin and on which she paints and uh, creates uh, uh, these images that are mostly reflection of uh, some microscopic views. So this is also uh, my point that uh, uh, that I'll, I'll come to that uh, once I discuss because uh, uh, unlike what I have uh, uh, mentioned at the beginning when I talk about uh, the, the pandemic and the biocultural agenda, normally in a discussion that the agenda is given first, but but I would say that this is an agenda in the making. So maybe by the end of the talk we will be able to come to some of these uh, points in agenda which could be taken up for the research. So. Um, so that is a, a, a bit of a problem with the title that I uh, admit at the beginning and because it, this is an agenda in the making. So uh, one of the points in that agenda that we will uh, look at very closely later uh, is about a, a, a microscopic gaze, a perspective which is going to change the way we look into art and also the way art is produced and uh, cultural texts are also produced. So um, uh, coming back to Ray's, uh, her um, paintings are mostly the reflections of the microscopic views and her style is made of, as you can see, um, it's made of uh, many smears and stains and blobs rather than very concrete recognizable objects. So this is one art and her paintings and her other artworks are uh, available and one could even see, uh, look at them to see the, 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 the peculiarity. And the, the second work that I want you to have a look at is, uh, is a painting by Rohan More. Uh, he's a Mumbai based uh, painter and off late, uh, especially in the, in the backdrop, backdrop of the, the pandemic, he has taken up this uh, uh, project of uh, rendering uh, a lot of these uh, biocultural images and the one particular um, which I found very interesting is uh, you find in uh, find a human being in a, a bottle of sanitizer um, and surrounded by by animals and there is also foliage you can say um, framing the uh, the image. Uh, what one finds here is an interesting reversal of the situation where uh, animals are getting a break. They are getting a break in the canvas. If you look at closely, animals are getting a break from the relentless human activity while uh, the captor, you know, a human being who is uh, usually the captor, is now the new captive um, in the context of, uh, uh, of the microbes and the pathogens uh, which surround us. So this, according to me, is another uh, biocultural rendition of uh, human condition. And third one uh, is completely different in style. Uh, the, the painting is titled Lull and it's by uh, a Bengaluru based uh, painter Shweta Vishwakarma. Uh, she is an artist. She also makes designs. Uh, she is also actively involved in advertising. Um, she, what one finds in this painting, uh, is, uh, is 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 a small image of a bird. We find the the plants, but all of them are um, depicted uh, typically in a cubist style with uh, uh, angularities everywhere, and this is like uh, uh, someone looking at the clear sky though uh, well located within the balcony probably and uh, what one finds is uh, is a bird and possibly a bird call in that and the the pandemic thereby offering uh, 
um, ironically though, uh, a kind of epiphany in a cubist mode of depiction. So this is another um, interesting um, painting, uh, visual depiction. Uh, one could also look at uh, a few other painters and cartoonists, and one of them is uh, pretty much in Nagpur, Rohan Chakravarti. Uh, he made a very interesting cartoon strip. Uh, um, and this is about uh, uh, a dialogue between a bat and a pangolin and two uh, prime suspects of this uh, pandemic. And it's about the, uh, the that cartoon strip, um, which is easily again available online. Um, I have not included that as a part of my slides. So uh, it's about the destruction of uh, animals, natural habitat and the resultant weakening of uh, uh, their immune responses as carrier animals. So uh, this again uh, through cartoon strip leads us to a sharp focus on how human animal relationship gets redefined and particularly in the context of this uh, microbial world. And another uh, image that I want you to look at closely is an art form that has emerged in the recent years, uh, particularly in the context of, uh, again, COVID-19 virus. Um, it's called bioartography. This has been there ever since the 1990s, I believe. Um, uh, it specialized particularly in uh, uh, various studies, particularly at the University of Michigan. Uh, this is a, a fascinating combination of art and science, uh, largely um, computer generated images. Now, most of the, this, this particular image of um, COVID-19 virus is uh, very popular because uh, um, this has been circulated almost all, all, over uh, all social media and um, many of the, uh, the images that we have seen are very similar to that. They, they've been, these images have been produced uh, with a particular process and uh, an art called bioartography. Uh, so this is an attempt. Bioartography uh, is an attempt to turn science into art because uh, uh, somewhere in, uh, uh, in uh, at this University of Michigan, they have realized that uh, science needs a bit of art to reflect the microscopic aspects of life for the general people. And this leads us to a very interesting statement, which I, I had read somewhere in the context of photography, that beauty is in the lens of the beholder, not in the eyes of the beholder, but in the lens of the beholder. So somewhere these uh, uh, electron microscopic uh, images are indeed very artistic and they, 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 they reveal certain colors and patterns that are very similar to any good painting. So it is an attempt then, I would say, bioartography is an attempt then uh, to enrich both art and science mutually. So somewhere uh, art gets enriched with the, the microscopic gaze while science um, gets a medium to reach out to common people as well. So these are my uh, prefatory uh, images uh, with which we could go deeper into this uh, discourse. I also want you to look closely at, uh, um, again, uh, two quotes, one um, from Alexander Pope. Somewhere in 18th century, he, in his very famous uh, work, Essay on Man, had these lines. Uh, let's consider this. And my entire project is an attempt to, to interrogate the philosophy behind these lines. So let's read that closely. Why has not man a microscopic eye? For this plain reason, man is not a fly. So um, what Pope says that there is a difference between, uh, there is a clear cut distinction between human beings and those uh, relatively smaller lives like uh, flies. Say what the use were finer optics given to inspect a mite, not comprehend the heaven. So uh, in his exalted view of man, Pope seems to be telling us that 
human beings are created not to inspect very small things but rather uh, to inspect uh, the heaven probably the sky so here is maybe this is the beginning where we have a, a conflict between uh, a microscopic gaze and a telescopic gaze so uh, what pope is also very vehemently asserting here is that that man is not a fly and and man obviously is not given to study uh, smaller things and he have he will definitely have higher ambitions and higher uh, relatively more significant topics to study um, this seems to have been punctured currently i believe in this uh, in this world particularly the the pandemic has uh, definitely punctured this uh, uh, you know this this philosophy of humanism that one finds in these lines and uh, as a contrast to this is what uh, a, a wonderful um, you know um, naturalist and also um, a very interesting writer and a biologist theodor rozak in his work where the where the wasteland ends a work which came out in 1972 and subsequently uh, he went on to uh, write extensively about uh, uh, a philosophy and an idea called biopsychology and how nature and human psyche are uh, closely linked and how mutually they can heal um in that uh, context he says nature composes some of her loveliest music this word music can be replaced even with poem for the microscope and telescope so here is a perspective of uh, rozak which seems to be completely opposite to that of pope indicating that there is a need as uh, rozak points out to look at look at some of the lives maybe and look at some of the objects uh, around us uh, uh, through a microscope as much we need to see the far off things using a telescope so this uh, need to magnify uh, to get more textures and more details is what is implicated by rozak in that so i proceed uh to first look at my key term here that bioculture so what is then bioculture uh it is is a is a combination of biological and cultural studies and wherein biological and cultural factors are studied especially those factors that affect human behavior and with an formed by many other disciplines like medical science social sciences landscape ecology cultural anthropology biotechnology and disability studies is another uh, interesting emerging and also very healthy interdisciplinary domain and it also all of them will come under bioculture and it is also then by cultural factors or biological factors but a mixture of both an intersection of both and so on and so this is an attempt to look at biology and culture as reciprocal causal factors in human evolutionary history so this is where it overlaps with the cultural anthropology and very particular in this context is the notion of gene when uh, cattle rearing started uh, developing lactose tolerance and then uh, result so it would have innovations and imagination and expression when it comes to art and literature so you find a situation where again in um, in anthropological past that cooking um, made this uh, um, uh, this uh, the nutrient um easily available and which resulted in what is called this carbohydrate revolution 
so uh, gene that way gene culture evolution is more about the genetically transport transmitted dispositions um, that prompt all components of culture and culture in turn leading to um, to to stronger evolutionary impulses and so on so um, it in a way indicates that uh, that uh, human biology and human culture have very close links and they have been evolving they have been co evolving so um, from that i come to this idea that uh, that we are currently into a lot of biocultural research and then man can be uh, said to be a biocultural species not purely biological not purely cultural so uh, so this is an area biocultural research is an area that would combine ecological socio economic and political analysis of particular society with an analysis of society's imaginative culture its ideologies religions philosophies and even literary and artistic practices that uh, culture thereby has a direct bearing of uh, ecology and ecology definitely reflects and is conditioned to a large extent by the culture as well and it is also an attempt this biocultural research is also an attempt to identify to find out and to explore the causal links between uh, particular cultural ecology ecologies and the basic elements of human nature like the motives emotions uh, personality and and our cognition and so on so um, see cultural ecologies shape almost all of them is a kind of awareness then um coming to our context again um looking at human cultural behavior in the context of the pandemic uh, let's look at how um certain cultural behaviors have been influenced by uh, the spread of infectious diseases uh, especially in the past and also we will reexamine that in the in the present context and it is here that uh, i would talk about carolyn auburn um who is uh, leading the department of health science at the university of missouri who um came out with this uh, very significant statement that culture is one of the most fundamental ways that shapes how we live in the world we are both biological and cultural beings so when a disease spreads through large parts of the world's population we can cope with that in both the biological and cultural ways the what she throws open to this discussion is that is that some of the biological crisis could be addressed culturally and some of the cultural crisis could also be addressed biologically so this again is uh, is an exploration of this overlap of uh, biology and culture to examine that in the present context um uh, with a lens that we draw from the past um orban talks about uh, how in the past in various countries there has been a uh, hesitation on the part of people to uh, take uh, vaccines so um, so measles as a disease uh, has a vaccine and in many many countries this, there was a resistance against that and this is comparable to the current um, vaccine vary situation that we have in the contemporary society especially when we are aware that russia has come out with uh, a statement that uh, they have made a vaccine so imagine that vaccine is made available in india um, what i mean by this situation is what we are currently going through and this is also very closely linked to uh, this term that she uses a wonderful term that germ panic um, particularly about the immigrant population so the natives and the immigrants are separated by this cultural phenomenon called germ panic so the whole suspicion and fear of uh, uh, people who cross the borders and who thereby become uh, germ carriers uh, is a kind of a divide that we find today in many world societies all right now Uh, going uh, deeper and also a bit broader into 
this notion of uh, anthropology and our COVID-19 situation. Uh, looking at this anthropology of this pandemic, um, I would rather make a statement that uh, uh, till the outbreak of uh, this pandemic, we were into what is called this uh, um, Anthropocene and most of you might have uh, understood that, uh, must have read the term. Um, Anthropocene is a, is a term that we uh, normally associate with the, the current geological epoch, um, the current geological epoch or the age wherein we understand that our species, human beings have been largely responsible for the increased carbon emission, global warming, habitat destruction and so on. So to indicate that that we have been responsible for the the, the change in the current phase of of, uh, of the planet. So um, I would say that uh, I would borrow that word, that part of the word seeing and uh, add it to Corona. So we are currently maybe into this um, new epoch of microbes where the human domination of an era could be challenged by the um, you can say the by this dominance of uh, the virus or maybe the microbes that this will lead us to this idea that uh, you know like uh, uh, it would also lead us to a few questions will will our nationalist xenophobia will lose its appeal in the face of virus because virus doesn't uh, know borders and uh, it doesn't know uh, any any div divides that exist among human beings or will it only trigger uh, more um, manifestations of social darwinism uh, considering certain groups as more vulnerable while certain other groups can survive so i believe that looking at this as a fulcrum um, in understanding our evolution, our anthropology, we could we could say that uh, that this is a perfect moment for us to lead uh, to to go into new understanding of uh, human beings in relation to their social and ecological worlds um, and uh, their relation to each other. And this also leads us to another interesting concept called biocultural diversity. Bioculture, bioculture D also. Uh, subscribes very strongly to this idea of biocultural diversity. Um, so biological and cultural diversity are dependent on each other and biocultural diversity is managed, conserved and created by different cultural groups. So um, this is a paradigm. This uh, paradigm of biocultural diversity is something that can be uh, borrowed and implemented by academia, practitioners and even policy makers. Um, so uh, what, that, what does that include? It, it's a very broad canvas that includes genes, species, ecosystems, land, landscapes, seascapes and so on, including of course uh, artistic expressions of them. Uh, it is in this context that I would talk about uh, two other interesting um, thinkers. One is uh, David Suzuki. Uh, he is a, a Canadian environmentalist and activist and also a science broadcaster who is very famous for his uh, uh, series that some of you might have already seen, The Nature of Things. And uh, the, the present pandemic has uh, made him, um, compelled him rather to make a, a few statements. And let's look at that and then we move on to the other uh, expressions as well. Um, so as we emerge from this pandemic, we must be guided by the examples and teachings of indigenous people practicing reciprocal obligations of responsibility to do everything possible to ensure that nature can continue to thrive. So Suzuki very strongly subscribes to this environmental wisdom and attitude of the indigenous people to, to nature. And a similar idea is seen reflected by uh, Liet Vasur, um, who is a professor of uh, biological science at uh, Brock University. And she also 
uh, is a UNESCO chair in community sustainability works and bio, uh, bi biocultural diversity. And uh, Vasur also brings in this um, similar idea. And let's read that as well, because they have been living closely with nature for generations. The indigenous people know peoples know how to live sustainably within planetary boundaries. We are realizing more and more that indigenous knowledge and science must come together. We simply have no other choice. And continuing with this very same argument, we would lead to uh, the idea of uh, um, cultural keystones. Uh, this is an idea that comes up um, um, largely in, uh, you know, the Native American totemism and also some of the tribal religions, uh, which obviously has become a very interesting concept even in conservation. Um, what is then? Now, yeah, it's in this in this context that we need to understand what this keynote species is all about. A keynote species is a species with very high impact on a particular ecosystem. And it is very important that species becomes very important in conservation biology. And many of these uh, keynote, uh, sorry, key, keystone species, many of these keystone species prevent the dissemination of plant species. For example, a tiger being the ace predator in Indian jungles prevents the dissemination of plant species by uh, controlling the, the population of herbivores. So tiger then in Indian context also as, as, a, as a philosophy behind Project Tiger, I believe it is the very identification that uh, tiger is a keystone species in Indian context and it, it continues to be in India, Bangladesh and other some of the other Asian nations. Um, it is it's in this context that we could look closely at a wonderful um, activist uh, from Canada, Dr. Leroy Little Bear. Um, he is an elder of a tribe, uh, elder of a tribe called Kainai tribe. And um, he, he was the one to initiate uh, Canada's first ever Native American studies. And people in Canada and especially the First Nations people, they don't believe that Canada and America are two nations. Uh, so they um, he is an advocate for First Nation education, rights, language and culture. And uh, working somewhere uh, located in Alberta, uh, Leroy Little Bear uh, makes a very few, uh, makes very significant observations about the keystone species, especially the buffaloes in their context. And it's, those statements are not just poetically appealing, but then they are also very, very deep. We could really read them. First one, the disappearance of iconic symbol in a society means the beginning of the disappearance of a culture. So he's of the opinion that the disappearance of uh, those buffaloes from their landscape was also in a way um, the death of a culture represented by this these animals. Um, he continues, imagine what would happen to Christians if all Christian crosses and churches were gone. The disappearance of the buffalo had a similar devastating effect on our people. Our youth now hear our buffalo song stories and watch ceremonies, but they do not see the buffalo roaming around. So this is all about the disappearance of the keystone species and what happens to culture. Uh, a wonderful biocultural uh, osmosis that we can talk about. Then let's also look at very quickly um, what this biocultural landscape could be. Um, looking at an Indian context, maybe the human tiger or the human elephant biocultural landscape where the elephant corridors are not blocked. And currently we have those corridors being blocked. And that is one reason why we have uh, a uh, lot of these elef human ele elephant conflicts. And um, that becomes a denominator for the culture nature connection. Um, a wonderful study that has happened um, recently 
uh, is about the the presence of sparrows in mumbai and in recent uh, decade in the last decade or so uh, the sparrow population in mumbai has uh, come down and mm, uh, maybe we, we could look at this um, in the light of the pandemic also maybe whether we are witnessing a return of the sparrows as these uh, uh, again keystone species in mumbai landscape and also um, the whole idea of the spiritual and cultural rebirth of uh, all kinds of people all communities of the world um, my idea here is that that i would very strongly like to consider the microbes as uh, keystones because uh, uh, i personally believe that um, we have witnessed and we or rather we are witnessing also that uh, the changes that these microbes can make on human culture and uh, the way we understand life way we understand our literature also leading from that is where we uh, look at that how the pandemic and how this uh, how these microbes have uh, redefined our idea of travel writing uh, very quickly if you look at that the lockdown uh, has redefined travel space um, a lot of notions like uh, travel space mobility distance mode of transport and so on uh, what one finds very conspicuously in our literary map is a textual absence though we find covid poems we find uh, covid blogs and we also find uh, maybe stories and novels written on uh, on lockdown experiences we find a conspicuous absence of uh, travel memoirs in our bicultural memory years later when we look at uh, look back at the pandemic era we might find this vacuum Uh, so what is happening currently is that this this uh, famous wonder lust is getting re-rendered in the form of blogs on solo drives people are taking solo drives and writing about that bike rides that they take or long walks and uh, talking about their immediate uh, surroundings so um, maybe um, the pandemic will redefine travel writing completely and thereby um, there will be more focus on home instead of the exotic foreign adventures we might even look at uh, immediate circumstances especially in a context where the borders are closed and flights many flights are grounded so um, the very um, structure and also the thematic patterns might change um well um what then are the features of bicultural literature i'll come to a little bit of literature as well um one i believe that poetry and fiction um which are increasingly get, getting informed by life sciences um the 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 realism itself is getting re- redefined with the uh, microscopic details um we we get to also as a kind of a mood a matter of fact staring down with new details and tex- textures at the same time a clinical distance emotional distance as well uh, then we have started considering covid-19 as an environmental episode that points to a bicultural decline uh, the very um, origin of this zoonosis uh, can be marked as a, a point in bicultural decline um, we are also looking at uh, many bio orthographic verses that we can talk about um which are rendered on many surfaces and also taking a lot of input from our uh, maybe microscopic gaze so uh, we are also moving into what is called um you know uh, microscopy as a technique in rendering and also this term electron tomography which is an extension of electron microscopy uh, used very often to obtain 3d structures of many sub cellular objects so this gives us a kind of a three dimensional analytical tool um this is one uh, matter of fact perspective of uh, uh, through a microscope 
of the virus that we are talking about. Um, somehow I find them um, appealing as well, though they are two dimensional images. There is an element of art even in the way they uh, come to manifest themselves. And uh, probably this is what we might get in future, even in artistic reflections. I'll, I'll quickly read not much, but then I'll very quickly read two of the, the poems. I have more, but then I'll be for the shortage of time. Uh, we will quickly read two of these verses. They are not complete poems. Recently, there was an attempt to publish a few uh, pandemic poems, and one of them is by Richard Baniel, Banis of uh, Philippines, and the poem um, is titled Pandemically Ironic. So let's read this to see this uh, shift from modern or maybe postmodern to micro modern or what I would call micro patho modern or what I would call micro bio modern um, perspective. We shield our faces to filter the airways that may be invaded by a protein coated villainy. Mark that expression protein coated villainy of, or, of origin still unknown. We shut our doorways, homestay, homestay. So I'm uh, particularly interested in the metaphors such as the filter, um, protein coated. Now these are the perspectives that you get, especially when you get into micro realism or what I would call the micro modern realism that we are talking about. Um, I will not read this poem because it's relatively uh, a little longer, but then I'll take uh, this poem by Sally Morgan. Uh, Sally Morgan's poem, My Corona. Um, the poem is uh, very interesting, not only with the texture, but also the kind of posture that she takes uh, in addressing um, the pandemic. Uh, look at all the textures that, uh, that the poem generates and also the images. Um, the coronavirus looks like a dog toy I, or a child's koosh ball with its primary color and fanciful shape. So what she has obviously looked at is, uh, is that bioartographic image of that, uh, of that virus. How can something so whimsical be so insidious? It has sinned, infected me, mind you, but it has changed me, morphed into odd, complex chimera. I have developed a fly's eyes. This is the point. Fly's eye is just opposite to what uh, Pope had said that human beings should not have. I have developed a fly's eyes to see danger on surfaces. Now, this is exactly the the perspective. This is exactly the um, uh, the microscopic perspective and also the microscopic anxiety that we have developed. Like a squirrel, I bury food in nooks and crannies for a distant time. I don a carapace. Carapace is uh, basically a shell, like the shell of a tortoise. I don a carapace to venture out, which I shed like a snake skin on the return to my door. So this is another wonderful example of, um, I would say, a perspective that brings us to, brings us very close to what is called uh, micro pathomodernism or microbio modernism. Um, I will not uh, read this entire poem, but only the second part on the right side, wherein uh, Renata Stabbard um, in her poem, a viral composition says uh, only that part, the second part, pathogen free, pathogen free. Uh, this is what we were talking about. Uh, uh, are human beings living in a pathogen free environment or are human beings pathogen free? Pathogen free, some have said, but I vote allies instead. There is so much at unknown viral footprints of our chromosomes. Now these, this last line for me is the key, holds the key, that our art definitely, especially visual art, some of them that we uh, looked at, and also poetry and many other expressions are definitely moving in the direction of isolating, identifying and articulating the viral footprints of our chromosomes. 
well as i promised this is my last slide and uh, we'll come to the agenda at the end because this is an agenda in the making this is an agenda wherein all of us can add with our perspectives and our micro modern sensibilities micro bio modern sensibility we could add a lot more points to that um, we are now uh, in a situation where uh, cultural texts have started negotiating the widespread vision of future because the pandemic has brought out a vision of future our future is very often now seen as a disease death and dystopia maybe cultural text can mediate that um, perspective uh, counter it also to some extent um, now we also have started using literature from some of the poems that we have seen uh, literature resisting the feeling of uh, erosion of the givenness of life now what the pandemic has done is uh, it has uh, uh, in a way um, attack the very base and the foundation of anthropocene by uh, corroding and eroding uh, the givenness the idea of givenness of life life is no more uh, a given fact it's something more than that we are caught in more contingencies more microbial contingencies also um, we are also getting into what is called this remediation of uh, uh, relationship between art and life especially compelled by uh, the new reality and poetry and narrative in this world will continue and and, and will have to um, act as human cognitive control over uh, the vast chaos that surround us that that really has surrounding us and then we will also reach as i have already mentioned new realism and alternate notions of subjectivity because i as an individual is not germ free and hence my own identity is to some extent decided by the the microbes so the idea of subjectivity spatiality especially as in uh, travel writing um spatiality and temporality in terms of time so time has uh, in a way become very relative it has lost to some extent its specificity for example uh, the time of a lecture office hours work from home all of them have changed in the context of this pandemic and i believe that in uh, this taking this as our cue uh, we could tell that we are fast definitely moving from modernism or even later post modernism to micro patho modernism and micro bio modernism so our uh, studies and our research will de definitely accommodate uh, the input from both biology and culture and in a more fruitful way for both the disciplines thank you so much So, sir, I've got a few questions for you from our yeah, viewers. Yeah, if, if time permits, we will okay. definitely. Uh, yeah. One of the questions is such a basic. I say uh, she has asked about uh, what is the difference. If I'm to make off from what she has asked, uh, the difference between literary text and context. I mean, she has just gone. What? How can you? How do you emphasize on literary text and context? Okay. What I'm. Uh huh. All what right. literary text if you go by uh, may be informed by new criticism or even structuralism uh, text is anything that is written or spoken so it could be a poem it could be a play or it could be even uh, you know a punch line from advertisement advertisement can be a part of the text so that is the text um, the context definitely is uh, um, if you go by a very conventional definition of that Uh, the socio-economic, cultural background in which the text is produced will become the 
will become the context and it is generally said that the text and the context overlap and uh, it is said that uh, context very often create the text and that was my uh, talk was largely about that that we are into a new context and hence we are witnessing and we are reading new text so the second question is uh, uh, in in today's pandemic context we need to evolve a new eco pedagogy uh, and which text will you recommend for inclusion in our curriculum okay so um, uh, this 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 whole idea of the eco pedagogy um, is in the making is in the making and i can suggest maybe one or two names um, uh, they are uh, working on that one is uh, Dr. Scott Slovich, Scott Slovich, and uh, he is currently engaged in a project wherein he is collecting uh, these theoretical perspectives on uh, the new pedagogy, wherein um, understanding one's environment and also um, the, the the precarity of the environment as a part of our analysis. So he is of the opinion. um that this should be taken very seriously and scott slovich is one and currently as such as i said we are theorizing in the process of talking about it so it will take probably a couple of years to come out with some works so uh, uh so one question is uh, maybe you mentioned a number of uh, biological aspects uh, one after the other so why do you consider microbes as part of keystone culture is it microbes in what yeah. respect all right yeah now that's a very thanks for the question um this is what i have been uh, uh, trying to explain that uh, so far our focus was on species they were who, which were uh, or rather who were um, big enough to be considered maybe an elephant or a tiger or maybe a buffalo or even we could talk about sparrows because they are easily visible now a keystone species is a species which has tremendous impact on the on the on on the biological as thereby on all other aspects of the society so currently at least we need to from the from the from the wisdom of living through um, the pandemic we need to really understand that maybe the very notion of anthropocene is been challenged by this corona scene or uh, microbe scene which uh, which marks the beginning of a new epoch and uh, we need to really consider the presence and absence of certain microbes as conditioning the life as well as the culture that's why i brought in uh, microbes as a keystone species Uh, so uh, one more uh, one question is coming as there would be uh, what do you consider the future of the pandemic inspired poems the future uh, what is the future of these poems i i can you know i can only give you a speculative answer uh, i have been reading a lot i mean it's not just a future i mean it has been happening now like if if you look at even if you casually google you will find thousands of poems written on covid 19 lockdown experiences there have been plenty of publications uh, um dealing with that uh, there are many organizations that they have which have called for uh, poems to be published um in the making of what is called the cultural memory of uh, uh, pandemic uh, the future is very clear maybe um, maybe uh, in coming days uh, we will not be able to get rid of this very idea that we are living in a you know uh, in a world of peril in a world of peril and hence i think there will be more images and metaphors and also world views which will accommodate the presence of microbes the virus and the will the poems will definitely articulate the uh, the precarity of human condition um, unlike uh, what we used to believe in an anthropocentric way as the apex creation uh, the, the the whole idea that man is an apex, apex creation will be challenged i believe even in new poems particularly there is a scope for a new epic to be written with this perspective so uh, but there was you know uh, a century back there was the spanish influenza yeah. uh, did did it did it inspire some work during yes, that period yes yes there were there were works based on uh, uh, spanish influenza there were also works based on plague which happened in the the last yeah, century shakespeare's time elizabethan time yeah. 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 even from that even from 16th century even oh. in the 
19th uh, early uh, 20th century witnessed plague even in india so okay, i, um, yeah, I happen yeah. to read a very interesting travel log uh, yeah. written by uh, someone called prince krejovic he is from serbia who had come at that time in the early decades of 20th century who had come to mumbai at uh, that time it was bombay and he talks about uh, how um, the corpses were taken together and buried uh, or rather uh, um, you know they, they were uh, how a proper cremation was not possible at that point of time so we have enough literatures on that definitely yes uh, sir sir so uh, uh, will the poetry of the present what what's happening will it redefine our approach to the works of the past will the present uh, make a, make us relook at the past will it redefine our reading of the past well it, uh, again thank you so much for that question um, which is very very significant a point to discuss and i would rather take a new historicist perspective uh, like stephen greenblatt or alan sinfield i would say there will be a meaningful healthy dialogue between the present cultural context and the cultural context of the past so what will happen is in the process the the both the you know uh, bodies of literature will be enriched the present perspective will enrich the literature of the past and the literature will from the past will anyway influence the way we think and uh, write even in the present so there will be an uh, will be a healthy trafficking of uh, ideas and images and perspectives and world views yes, that's right so uh, oh, one question which comes to my mind is it will these works stand the test of time as we talk about the masterpiece of the past because uh, will it stand the test of time or have we drifted away have we drifted away from our calling or whatever you could have from our subjects there are a lot of a lot of words terminology is used mm -hmm. yeah again a very interesting question um, the answer to which will be uh, given only by time and what is very important i believe is to make an effort to document yes and as long as there is an effort to document for example the trauma this is also trauma so in a way it will be aligned to trauma literature largely uh, for example uh, we had first world war literature okay it stood the test of time it was completely different from the the literature that was written before that similar was the rise of existentialism after the second world war and uh, it also stood the time now what happened in those two occasions i would say um, was an attempt to document the socio cultural impulses of the time and what might happen and what probably is happening is also as i told you uh, an attempt to create the cultural memory even as we are living those moments so we could call it as simultaneous history if you could so uh, i feel that uh, is it as the common perception is that we are trying to reinvent ourselves because we are taking on the other disciplines the sciences so we mm -hmm. are trying to establish our own space mm -hmm. is you know this i mean it may have a positive connotations mm -hmm. but this is an effort to create our own space is it not so with physics other engineering subjects so we are trying to create our own i mean space is it true um, our own identity you you brought me to a very very interesting uh, debate um that takes us to the very debate on disciplinarity of studies if you look at the politics of disciplinarity i would say the kind of disciplines that we have in india is a colonial leftover in fact the department of english and we have this pressure to move into more transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary attempts there is no harm in actually going into interdisciplinary models um with full awareness that uh, if uh, interdisciplinarity dilutes the core subject we should also realize that disciplinarity itself was to some extent very artificial because it is an academic interest it's for a, yeah. the, it's a part of the academic politics that we created these disciplines so say so, uh 
you have, you have given wonderful answers to our questions. It is really, I mean, uh, really uh, touched us. And uh, uh, we, uh, we are very lucky to have Dr. Dinesh uh, Kumar Nair. I mean, uh, uh, he has done wonders. And even beyond my what, uh, something which even I did not accept, so to make a very candid admission. So you have really uh, uh, tra traversed an area which I was maybe I was new to, and you have spoken on many aspects, which is very pertinent, very pertinent. So about painting micro uh, microbes, about uh, aspects of us which we were not aware, man, man as a captive, we are, so the roles are rivers, the roles are rivers. The man is at the receiving end. You have highlighted this wonderfully. You spoke about uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, certain key symbols, the key symbols. Now the, we are, we are, uh, we said that size matters. We are size matters, but uh, you have, uh, uh, you have said no. Now we've got different markers. You talked about the sparrow. You talked about the sparrow, the return of the sparrow. And uh, you spoke about biocultural diversity. Uh, uh, a reciprocal obligation and uh, and uh, uh, genetically transmitted dispositions and uh, in uh, biocultural research that again would uh, that again could drive us that again could drive us to uh, taking uh, to proceed along those lines and again a very interesting picture of man as a biocultural species and uh, uh, the political analysis of uh, is a, of of society and. Uh, in fact, this in fact is a very, a very novel way. In fact, we were used to a traditional approach. Now you have placed an emphasis because man is a product of, uh, uh, you know, uh, as you said, uh, both uh, his genetic makeup and the environment and the environment both go into it. We, you spoke about bicultural uh, theory. I, I missed the name. In fact, uh, 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 human, human and bicultural beings. In fact, we talk and you also quote about Alexander Pope, Alexander Pope. Alexander, uh, very interestingly, a uh, good adaptation. And as you again, more that you adapted to Keats' quote, the beauty of the uh, the beauty does not lie in the eye of the beholder, but in the in the lens of the photographer. It's a very, I mean, something very new. A good, into very smart uh, adaptation. So, uh, uh, and I'm uh, so uh, we have talked about uh, genetically trans uh, transmitted dispositions and uh, and uh, human be human beings and human culture having close links. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, research would combine ecological, socioeconomic, political analysis of a of a uh, of society. And uh, uh, you sp also spoke about cooking. Cooking, in fact, cooking, in fact, uh, something released to the brain. Something released to the brain, and it ran, and uh, uh, it could also develop some into some sort of technological innovation. Innovation that is maybe some area which we have never thought of. Maybe there are some, as I mentioned in the introduction, as I spoke about your biodata, something about cooking too is there. Uh, in, anyway, the, uh, in fact, uh, uh, you spoke about uh, the pandemic offering a sort of epiphany in a, in, a, in fact, uh, in a cubist mode. Paintings, were, painting, some paintings were exhibited. Pandemic offering, offering an, an epiphany in a cubist mode of depiction. And you spoke about the painting of the cartoon strip of Rohin Chakravarti. Rohin Chakravarti, and uh, maybe we were not aware of that. And uh, uh, maybe some other, uh, I don't know, Shweta Vishwakarma. Uh, Shweta Vishwakarma is from Bengaluru. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, that's what uh, ever in, in, in presented in cubic style. In cubic style, so. Um, so anyway, this has been a wonderful presentation. Many of the many of the terms are purely biological. Maybe I was I took time to listen, and it is to some of the terms have escaped my presence. Maybe it will sink into me gradually. Anyway, this is something which is very inspiring for researchers. As I said, as I said in the introduction, this will open the floodgates for future researchers. I'm sure they'll pick up the thread somewhere. I've got something jotted down. Maybe I cannot go through this. Through this. Maybe uh, this will open the floodgates for future researchers. Maybe others will talk to you, will uh, know more about you, and they'll come to they you. Will, they will uh, come. So it's a great, uh, it was a, once, it was a great honor to have you, and we'll uh, hope that we meet again. <laughs> okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. So I uh, I hand over the mic to uh, Baljeet Mudaliyar for her for the second session.
the screen. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Sebi Joseph. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Baljeet Mudliar, the co-host of today's webinar. On behalf of the Department of English, St. Francis de Sales College, Nagpur, I once again welcome you all. We have come to the second part of the webinar. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please keep typing them into the chat box. I will bring them up after the presentation. We will have time for questions at the end. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to the second speaker of the webinar. For the next thought-provoking session, we have with us Dr. Abdul Muhammad Ali Jinnah, an associate professor from Jamal Muhammad College, affiliated to Bharati Dasan University, Trichy, Tamil Nadu. I feel honored to introduce Dr. Jinnah. Dr. Jinnah has 20 years of teaching and 12 years of research experience. He is an alumnus of Pondicherry Central University and gold medalist of the batch of 1998. He is a visiting professor at universities in Indonesia, including the State University of Semarang. He has given special lectures in more than 100 national and international conferences in different parts of India and abroad, including Sri Lanka, Thailand, Malaysia, Bhutan and Indonesia. He is a member of the Gothic Association of New Zealand and Australia and a reviewer for Common Ground Research Network, University of Illinois Research Park. He is a creative writer and has published flash fictions and horror narratives which are available on Amazon. He also offers creative writing courses and is an academic consultant on the Writing Gothic Fiction program in the University of Surakarta, Central Java. His inclination in research is towards pop culture, dread narratives, and post-human discourses. He also specializes in literary theory and the digital humanities. Dr. Jinnah is going to deliver an insightful and interesting lecture on let's, let's post-humanize ourselves, an ideological ready reckoner for our times. Now I invite Dr. Jinnah for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Manji. That was a lovely introduction. Uh, it's great to be in Nagpur, I should say. Of course, in the new normal, we are not physically meeting, but at least I'm there. It's always been my desire to come over to Nagpur and uh, uh, be a part of uh, any kind of a conference over there. So I thank the college for giving me this opportunity to be part of this very interesting webinar. Uh, I also take this opportunity to uh, appreciate the earlier speaker, uh, Dr. Nayak. Uh, his presentation was absolutely fantastic and it gave me uh, a lot of new ideas which I could probably, you know, ponder upon uh, maybe later on. Now, I am going to talk about an aspect which probably is something very uh, diametrically opposite to uh, Dr. Nayar. Am I, am I audible? Am I audible? Is my screen uh, visible for you people? Yes, yes, yes sir. sir. You are audible okay. and your screen is also visible. Yeah, okay. So that's nice. Now, as uh, I was introduced, I'm much into uh, what is called a dread narrator. Now, basically, a dread narrator, dread of course means fear. So I uh, basically interpret or uh, like to challenge the usual canonical narrators and try to look at them in a very counterfactual way. I kind of offer a contrapuntal reading to the usual conventional wave of reading. And I always look at narrators in a very different fashion and I call them the dread narrator. Uh, basically, when we use this particular uh, statement, the statement of you know, a dread narrator. It's about a kind of an analysis which offers you a kind of an insight into what what goes on into the human mind. Maybe I can uh, kind of quote uh, T.S. Eliot here when he talks about, you know, I can show you here in a handful of dust. I would like to look at narratives in that way. You know, narratives which probably show us fear. Uh, a kind of a psychological, metaphysical, 
sometimes physical fear because basically as far as we are concerned as far as the humans are concerned we always like to centralize ourselves we always like to foreground ourselves as the reasons why the world exists or the reasons why the world survives and i think throughout the uh, history of narrative throughout the history of any kind of writing we always have kind of assumed that it is great to be a human now 2020 yes i think made us introspect there were times i believe even in 2019 when i was talking to my students i was wishing them a very happy uh, upcoming year 2020 was the year where great things were supposed to happen i don't know all over all over hopes all over uh, ideas for the future i have gone haywire and can we call 2020 the anus horrible at least as far as we know because the generation of ours for us it's an eye opener because we are looking at the world in a very different way so i would like to start with a very important question i'm sure most of the uh, people would be giving an answer no is it actually a great time to be a human because 2020 was supposed to be the turn of the of, of the decade it's one of you know it, it was supposed to herald a lot of great things i guess you know even our former president said that it would be anus grabless but i don't know but fine maybe it's not a great time to be a human fine but maybe we should be looking at it in a very different perspective or maybe a very skewed perspective so for that i would uh, kind of like to paraphrase uh, 18th century german philosopher slash poet uh, friedrich holderin now he asked a very pertinent question there was a time when he was not allowed to write there was a time when he was banned and you know he was being trashed left right and center you know we talk about trolling today right in the 18th century i believe holderin faced a kind of a trolling because he wrote a particular poem called the blue danube in which he came up with some contradictory ideas which the people of that time they did not like so holding stop writing he said that's it i cannot write any more let me let me just leave it and he was questioned and he was kind of asked to come back into the uh, the writer's mold but he he had a simple answer you know he he answered with a question he said why write in indigent times like these i mean what's the purpose of writing why should i write what do i gain out of it now as i said i'm just going to paraphrase this question my question uh, something which i derive from uh, older him why do we live in indigent indigent times like these i mean these are times when there are i mean when he said when 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 holderin said that there is an indigency in those times he he also added a particular term he said there is no inward or there is no inward looking into things at all into concepts at all so i am asking you the same question and i would like to start open up with this question why do we survive in indigent times like i told you i i look at things in a very skewed perspective i i love bread narrative so i would like to offer you a a handful of tears here do we actually live in a time wherein the centrality of the human or the whole idea of humanity needs to be so exaggerated needs to be so uh, uh, maybe i could just borrow a term from dr bhaiya maybe has to be looked into from such microscopic vision 
I would just like to answer this with another terminology. We talk about something that is called a Galapagos syndrome. Now, of course, we know that Charles Darwin comes up with the theory of evolution, and in that he, you know, his his whole study of the evolutionary, you know, aspects of reaching to humanity basically starts as an experiment from the island of Galapagos. So, in a sense, a virgin island is introduced to the world vision. Why are media science that a great scientist lands on that island and from there all hell breaks loose? Today, the Galapagos Island is considered to be one of the most touristy spots in the world. Darwin wanted that island to be maintained in mutual exclusivity. Mutual in the sense. the organisms the creatures of that island have to be left in their virginal state not to be tampered upon and we live on our mutual exclusivity exclusivity outside the island that's what he proposed but that didn't happen that didn't happen there was a time when those uh, you know because of our intrusion because of the intrusion of a lot of people you know humans basically are the most intrusive of all species so because of our intrusion into you must have heard of you know horror stories a lot of horror stories like the extinction of the dodo one of those examples so the intrusion of the humans into this particular place led to a mass extinction of those animals so so the ecuador government they went in for a kind of a homeostasis where they said okay fine tourists can come but as long as there is a non interference of tourism so you go you watch those organisms but you don't touch them you don't go very near them and you come back so in that way a kind of a status has been maintained now there are two interesting writers who have taken up this idea of how a biosphere can survive with and without the intrusion you know it, it it's a kind of a ambiguity it's like a schrodinger's cat it's both there as well as not there so you have humans there at the same time humans are not there so kurt vonnegut one american postmodern writer he takes this as the theme of one of his novels that called galapagos Wherein he talks about a kind of a reverse evolution. Uh, the novel ends with humanity ultimately, you know, re-evolving or de-evolving into into primate. For him, it was kind of a fact checker because he felt that humanity, as it is, need not survive as it is. You know. and then there is another very interesting 20th century writer called joy or carol oats who takes up this idea in a short story wherein you find one of the characters a woman going to galapagos island and she 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 looks around and then she asks the question okay fine you want these creatures to be maintained in a primeval a very pristine state all that is fine but why do you have to make a show out of it why do you have to create an aura about it and why do you have to kind of uh, make money out of it why do you have to commercialize the very idea of an evolutionary island so these are very powerful questions that are being asked precisely because humanity as such you have to look at the island of galapagos as a prison because humanity as such has always tried to use the idea of isolation idealization the idea of survival in a very pristine uh, you know aquarium sort of a, a greenhouse sort of a, 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 a landscape a space and when you look into that and you 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 derive a kind of a A, a, a kind of a vicarious pleasure out of it.
what i am trying to point out is that i am not going to just you know look into the terminology of the entire thing i am trying to point out the idea of the essence of being a human of being what we are you know text of the text the sacred and the profane they always try to drive home the idea that we are the essence remember hark back to what i said the world survives because of us the world survives for us and it is we who are the caretakers of this entire planet it's almost as if we hold terra firma in our hands and you know a kind of an atheistic notion that we have but actually it's not so when we talk about the idea of the post human we need to realize that somewhere down the line the whole idea of humanity being the central the anthropocene as dr lyer was pointing out has kind of steward the entire balance of humanity i'm sorry of of the world of earth and life as we know it basically is kind of over it's been it's been it's been dying for so many years whatever the nay say is it, it, we are kind of killing off our 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 our, 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 our land you know our 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 world and we have the cheek to say that today we face a kind of a apocalypse my dear friend the apocalypse is already here it's been staring at us we just have to look over our shoulders the apocalypse is right there this is not the apocalypse it's just one blip in the entire you know movement of the world the apocalypse has already come and as you all know harari says that we are the apocalypse how is that for a direct narrator we are the apocalypse because harari says we just don't die gone are the days when we know we used to die very easily we just don't die our medical fields and you know technological advances have kind of made us live more and more and more our iqs have increased our eqs have not at all increased but our life expectancy has definitely increased so the question i think the question that we need to ask ourselves is that the scare that is staring right into our eyes the corona scare the corona challenge is it really something to be so depressed about is it really something to write panegyrics about because the development of the homo sapien has come from such a way from the homo erectus to the homo sapien to what we would generally call ourselves today as the homo deus we are the gods we are proud of being gods we own the world and the very fact that we use right we use the world we use the world around us as our own objects as objects to be consumed to be subsumed we kind of have a rationality for that also a rationality for which we love to reach out to the divine so my question is how do we rationalize rationalize times like these you know I, i i always have this one question that is asked to me in classes what do we do in times like these i ask 
my students what what do you mean by times like these what are like these he says humanity is going to come to an end i tell them humanity is never going to come to an end in this way there is not going to be the kind of a apocalypse in which you know it sweeps through the continents and you know people die like flies and you know at the end of it only 5% or 3% of humanity is going to survive that definitely not going to happen okay we are facing a blip i think said somewhere in the smooth road there is a bump but that small bump i know you might disagree with me when i say it, it's a small bump because more than 6 and a half lakh people have died yes i realize that. but when you look at the world the movement of chronology of time you understand that it's simply just a small bump a blip why do we have to rationalize rationalize things like this what is that idea where in you think that okay fine oh my god what's happening abhi are do if you look at uh, you know all those uh, statistics which probably come to you through the social network you must you must have seen that you know every 100 years this kind this kind of a thing always happens maybe it's just nature's way of getting even maybe it's just nature's way of you know avenging itself person so my dear friends i don't want us to consider these kind of questions because these kind of questions are not rational at all or rather they are rational for us because we always un- try to understand things in a very logical very coherent and in a way that you know it only essentializes humanity i say that it's not essentialize humanity at all why should we basically what humanity has created a narration is that we control everything but unfortunately when we look at the kind of control that we have over our lives or have over society or have over the world i think basically what we have created is the kind of a frankensteinian monster the the council says that you know the covid situation is basically a kind of an import come, that comes from you know the land of kung fu and it says it's one of those exoticities that have come from that land we have accepted their kung fu we have accepted their food we have accepted the you know the, the the idea of hard work the idea of you know societal hard work so why don't we just accept the idea of corona also fine it one of those great imports which have come from that nation but we would like to see it as their creation of a frankensteinian monster but look around us how many such monsters have we created why is it that you know when something befalls on us it's always the other whom we love to point our fingers at and say okay fine you know what it's not mine it's his the other the foreign the exotic the alien he to host but what about the monsters that we have created i think basically at the creation of every one of our ideas we jump around like victor victor frankenstein saying that oh my god my ideas are alive oh my god it's there but many of those ideas many of those concepts inventions discoveries which we put forward would be there in hindsight at a, a future generation which would be looking back and saying that okay you created this so the fault is yours
the idea of a recovery you know we all talk about that the idea of a recovery that two phase what how exactly is this recovery going to help us it seems russia has got a antidote people are going for that very soon india is also going to probably you know announce such a a great leap forward but this idea of a recovery where exactly are we going there are the naysayers who say that this recovery would only lead us to further paths of you know destruction the as the the it's a it's a, it's a kind of a college you know dead doctor life kind of a thingy where you would basically survive only as zombies and then there is another very pertinent question a very important question that is being asked how would that recovery help us i was just listening to the interaction uh, interaction session between dr nair and uh, uh, dr sabi it was very lively it was very challenging and dr sabi was asking dr nair a question how long would these narrative survive do they have a future do they have longevity excellent question dr nair obviously gave an answer as the optimist that he is but i would like to also point out the other side there have been he into pointed out very rightly that there have been plague narratives there have been you know narratives that were written during the spanish uh, flu how much of those plague narratives have survived or how much of them are we reading today as textbooks as narratives that help us understand the life in those times we talk about these times right of those times edgar allan poe remains the writer outside the mainstream he is read just as an indulgence someone like daniel defoe uh, you know the diary of the plague is not at all right again it's just a one liner in every history of english literature that we see or we read it's not considered worth while to read those narratives they are plague narratives they are apocalypse narratives i know today we are kind of you know scrambling around and searching for those books and you know gathering them and reading them and today we we even say that you know uh, probably someone like stephen king is one of the people who who, who foresaw everything and we give him a kind of a a position the position of somewhere out there in those plague and apocalypse narratives he was always a writer he was always a great writer why did we never place him in the mainstream why are these writers never taken over you see the idea of bread is always there only when we are facing a pandemic you live in a couple of years everything would be forgotten that's what humanity is that's what we are the sense of urgency that we are having now at this moment would probably be diluted very shortly i mean i'm coming mean, at the beginning of the uh, you know the quarantine I, there were no people around everyone had a mask the, the the kind of social distancing was being followed look around you today the most crowd obviously other than the hospitals is in a tea shop people go there and there's nothing being followed our kind of adaptation if you ask me is the kind of an adaptation which makes us just shrug it off and i have a, a fear i'm a pessimist so i have a fear that all these beautiful narrators that dr nayar was talking about today all these beautiful creations that dr nayar was talking about now probably might not stand the test of human time that's so unfortunate that's so unfortunate but i mean 
we do not know how exactly it's going to be but this is just a kind of a uh, you know a statement maybe a very cheerful statement but it's a statement that i am making i think so if we have lost the essence and we have lost the essence we have lost the essence look around us the whole idea of humanity the whole idea of being a human has been driven to death it's like flogging a dead horse so let maybe we should be talking post humanism and i'm not just talk, going to talk to you about the post humanism of cybernetics or you know technology and artificial intelligence i'm going to talk to you about post humanism in the sense that the humanism the idea of a humanistic ethic is dead the centralization of humanity the anthropocene is dead then you look at a pandemic and you fear for your life and you sit down and i do not know retrospect your retrospection is never about anything else other than the central core of the human that's why we talk about the home of us we are so preoccupied with ourselves that we just do not bother about whatever is happening around us docking falls of the selfish gene right we have that i think now more than ever it is very clear how selfish we are so you have rozi pradoti who says that you know it's time we talk about post humanism it's time we talk about the future of the world without humanity i think it would be very difficult for us to get that into our minds because we cannot envisage a world without us but if i do talk about the blip novel then i also have to tell you that we or our existence in this world has also is also a blip look at the history of the world and look at the time that we have survived we have existed in this world. so bradoti talks about the decentralization of the human remove the human from the center of everything remove every aspect the thread the fabric of the human from the center of everything and then look at the world in a way i know it's a disease that is afflicting us and i know we are dying i know we are suffering but i think someone like gradoti would tell you that in so what it comes to the hunt to do it very difficult i i i understand that it's very difficult to look at it that way but maybe maybe just maybe we should remove our thinking caps about ourselves place them somewhere and look at the world in a very different in a very can i use that word again in a very skewed perspective let's not look at the world from our ethic at all the so called human ethic which we talk about which we 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 we, we bombard the advertise they don't even exist for us i mean human to human they don't exist at all then why do we keep talking about it decentralize it remove it negate it erase it if 
bradotti can be considered the foremost voice of posthumanism today then i think it is time that we to heed to what she said listen to what she said someone you know on the other side of the spectrum a very uh, flippant yet a very irrational kind of a, a post human like robert pepperell who would use pop culture along with you know the profound ideas of post humanism would say that would lay down this you know uh, post human manifesto with around 30 35 edit uh, and one of his most important edits is that he says it is time we realize you know it's very clear that we are not the most important things in this world no that takes some time to enter because we have been nurtured in the idea that we are of course we are the world revolves around us the world survives for us the world is for us in order to become a human you need to embrace posthumanism it's a it's a flat statement in which as a human you transcend your humanity and you embrace the idea of the posthuman the factor the major factor being that humanity as a centrality is over as i said it's very tough to do that but it, i think i think this should be the challenge of our time i know we were talking about sitting down and retrospecting but i think the kind of retrospection that we are talking about has to be the retrospection this way so if bradotti says this and pepperell says that donna haraway tells us to hark back to a primeval time and a time even before history a time even before time existed and she's talking about those larger gods the primeval gods the gods which existed even before the dinosaurs you know the primeval beings in greek mythology you have protoss and gaia today they would be look down as symbols of paganism they are no longer respected they are no longer saluted in fact they have been kind of thrown away even from mythology so even the writer like rick riordan who basically you know survived on the rewriting of the greek myth he also looks at these elder gods in the way of being pagan monsters i mean if you have to point out paganism what what is why do you have to even segregate between modern paganism and you know ancient paganism and why should ancient paganism be looked on as something that is maleficent or evil she said let us celebrate that also and that's the reason why she uses a, a term like thulu thing thulu was the the primeval the first the elder created by someone like hp lovecraft like the great god sam thulu was someone who could instill madness into us just by his vision you understand how these later writings have always rejected and kind of kept the primeval knowledge is apart in 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 you know in 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 so many pushed in so many negative terminology are we saying that let's bring them back because the world as we have existed in is a kind of a world that has been parenthesized by a lot of revisions and emissions it's almost as if you know the elder gods have been packed away clean away 
from any kind of a story from any kind of a culture so let's bring them back harvey is not talking about the bringing back of monsters she is talking about the bringing back of ancient civilization the bringing back of ancient cultures and their knowledge there was so much of indigenous knowledge that was flourishing everywhere where has it gone that is the kind of pre human textuality and contextuality which these people want to bring back unfortunately we have lost them we read history of english literature and we talk about how certain writers have been lost in the passage of time these people have been lost maybe it's inevitable that humanity has led to this one the idea of the post human is to create a vision of something that is beyond our usual sense stubbornness arrogance of human that's why someone like a biopolitical theorist like agamben would look at the the very centrality of humanity as a fluidity it's not the brownian motion which just derrida talks about it's the brownian motion of how you incorporate or you designate cultural symbols or mythos to someone so in the 80s when agamben talked about the homo sapiens today he would be talking about the fluidity of the sapiens himself or herself because the sapiens himself does not exist today who is the sapiens the sapiens basically was a sacrificial goat on whom the entire you know the sin of the village would be placed on and thrown out or excommunicated from the from the village a person would be designated for that a person would be identified earmarked and he would be you know he would carry the sin from the village a, a kind of an ambiguity in which the person is both an out, outcast as well as you know a uh, some sacred at the same time but today who do we who do we you know it's like hydra had a monster who who do we locate on who do we focus on when we talk about post humanism we also need to understand that it is not just humanity versus all the other creatures it's also about the idea of humanity we versus they it's pretty huge to them everywhere we go it's always a question a talk of the we versus they what ethics what human ethics are we talking about when we have this kind of a idea of the enemy who kind of morphs from one place to the other from one head to the other the multiplicity of the enemy which brings us to the most important question okay it's a pandemic but is it really the end of the world i know we would love to you know maximize everything and talk about the new normal the world as it is going to be or the world as it is not going to be but this i could tell you that no it exists only in your mind so the more it exists in your mind the more it is out there that's why the pandemic and panic you know did it right the pandemic with d e m within bracket so it would read panic and within bracket you will read them so panic pandemic 
it is basically only here so in as much as it is here it is out there it's similar to how gorilla would have said talked about hyper reality it's that but it's not the so are we looking at a new kind of a hyper reality because there are people who are asking questions there are a lot of conspiracy theories which go into this as i said it's a hydra and a monster you never know in what direction to look at and how to try to understand this because it it it's not something that can be understood within the narrow parameters of the logical sense or the coherence that we usually have for it it's something that 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 mutates you know the the virus mutates the thought of the virus the thought of the pandemic is also mutating in, within us check how many enemies we have given to you know the spread of the coronavirus how many people we have manifested as super spreaders i mean on an international level one reason why agamben was talking about the fluidity of the sensor was because he actually took out the reports of you know the italian newspapers wherein at the beginning of the pandemic italy italy was hugely struck by the pandemic you remember in the early phase they didn't know what to do and the very easy way of you know escaping from that was simply to place it on the alien the migrant Okay, they brought them in. You understand how the chaser is just being thrown. It's very easy to absorb your things and just throw things at them. If we have to consider the question of posthumanism. We need to remove ourselves as the subject. The idea of the corona as a pandemic, as a fear, as a dread, is simply because we put ourselves as the subject. Two theorists, Embry and Lauro, they say that okay, fine, it's time that we embrace our anti-subjectivity. to remove ourselves as the subject remember when bradotti was bradotti was talking about decentralization this is almost the same in which our bodies need to become the anti subject not the subject and if you if you hark back to one of those images which i was show, which i was showing you the creation of the zombie once we remove our consciousness from our body our centrality from our body once we become anti subject we gaze in a way that is quite antithetical to our usual gaze that is the anthropo gaze the anthropo gaze of of the world is something that entails humanity to consume whatever they do we are almost like the spanish conquistadors whatever we see we are the monarchs of all these things but post humanism likes you to remove yourself from your body remove yourself from subjectivity and become object or at least anti subject and to reject the anthropogenic that is to reject the you you know the how we talk about using it's about learning how to unmute things around us and try to give a kind of a gaze which probably would be a gaze that would pertain to the whole thing but the answer is i know it's a huge challenge for us i know it's very difficult for us to even 
think about it, ponder. This kind of a removal of subjectivity from humanity. But I think, again, I think this is the right time for us to ponder because I seriously know that once all this blows over, once all this comes to an end, once we get back to our normative ways, we would not even have time to think about it. We would not even have, you know, these kind of deliberations. Now is the right time to think. So let us talk posthumanism, let us embrace posthumanism, let us look at the path to humanity through via media, the ideology of posthumanism. So this should be the ideology of our times. Let's get irrational. Let's not talk about rationality about because rationality basically limits our minds, which have been structured, nurtured, made to molded. <coughs> Maybe it's, it's time we became anti Descartes and all that. So, generally, the limit of our rational thought stops at a place. I think it's time posthumanism tells us that it, it's about you know, moving beyond that space, moving beyond that limitation, and thinking in terms of irrational. So, Tulusine is the acceptance of the irrational. I think the time for us to think about things only from the point of rationality has to end. The mind is a strange creature. Give it the space. Give it the freedom to think irrational also. That's one thing that we really need in our indigenous terms. Self and self. Right to this. Go with the flow. Look at things from the surf. Not from the surf only. It's time we learn surfing. Pun intended, obviously. Unintended because post humanism also involves cyber anxiety. But look how things have changed for us. As I said, I am in Nagpur now, I'm sitting within the confines of my of this room, but I'm I'm in Nagpur. So. For me, a person like me, it, it, it creates a lot of anxiety because I am not cyber savvy. I am not, I am not techno savvy. Hmm. So if you, if I, if I have to kind of, you know, push in, bring in ideas of, you know, artificial intelligence and techno post humanism, then maybe we need to also look at the world in a way wherein we overcome our dread of a lot of things. I am I'm, I'm talking basically about change. Things have changed. Let, let's accept that change and, you know, try to surf and ride the waves beyond them. the fear of missing out. Today everyone talks about FOMO, you know. 120 days, you know, quarantine, and we are talking about how much we have missed out with life. The travel, you know, the, 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 the food that we used to have outside, the everything, you know, the world outside, the life outside, that we generally love and talked about and paraded. We have missed out on all those things. But I think, Basically, in spite of all that, I think 
that we need to understand that okay fine this is how it's going to be and from this position of this understanding we need to evolve into different beings into beings which would probably be able to appreciate the world around us and i seriously mean the world around us as in not just in the world of nature or you know the world of beautiful landscape i'm talking about everything even mindscape the world of differences we need to look at that i think one of the most beautiful things in this world is the kind of differences that we have and i think this time we need to understand accept the ideologies of the different also different people different different whatever different everything and ultimately we need to understand the idea that in our wild desire for being the central we have also created a kind of a hollow cost which i would love to refer as the zulu cost because the flora the fauna everything that has been around us we have destroyed see this word hollow cost and the combination of that is something which people might not accept i i believe there was a time when peta came out with its own version of the holocaust where in it talked about you know how animals were being killed off in cosmetic uh, in, in the cosmetic industry and in the medical industry it created a huge uh, even trend because they said that you know holocaust is a word that you cannot equate with anything else yeah true but we also need to look at the other factor that we cannot accept that the death of humans can be equated with the death of animals at all but if you do if you do you will understand that the zoolocost is still happening around us still happening around us and all those people who decree it who all those i'm sorry all those people who decry it they would be considered as outcasts because we cannot simply accept the fact that this has to stop it's okay it's all about us right everything in the world exists only for the human right my dear friends all i wanted to do was show you the other side i know it's a tough these are tough times for us i know we are undergoing a lot of pain please do not think that i was trying to be little the pain i have also lost people to the corona virus somewhere in those 6 and a half lakh statistics there are at least three people from my family and at least four people from my friends yes so it's not that i am belittling whatever happened but what i am trying to make you understand sorry i should not be using the word understand but what i am trying to just you know convey to you is that the world consists of so many variations the world consists of so many so much of diversity i think it's time for us to embrace that diversity it is time for us to embrace that there is life beyond us like there was life before us there is going to be life beyond us so the ideology for our indigent times my dear friends is the ideology of trying to humanize ourselves by removing all those de facto definitions of humanity you know those boundaries which we have created the crust which we have created around the whole idea of humanity so of them break them off come out of that shell look around us 
because once we look around and once we try to accept we lose our indigence and we really become thinking being so i believe that's all i have for you people today thank you so much it was wonderful talking to you people and uh, it was great to use you people as my founding boards you know just throw out whatever i maybe irrational maybe ramble but just to throw out those things to you and you know, thank you so much it was wonderful Thank you, sir. Uh, it was a brilliant and mind-blowing session on post-humanism. Uh, how human being is being decentralized. It is a very good arena of research for the young researchers. Uh, now we will go ahead and take some questions. Uh, and sure. uh, I would like to say that uh, our chat box is deluging with appreciation for both the speakers. Um, the first question is: After the coronavirus incident. as well as accident does humanity in any way improved or diseased in every possible way uh, are we talking about the future or are we talking about the effect of sir i would like to give answers for both if we yeah. always live in the syndrome of fear there was a time at the beginning at the advent of this this this, this, this corona virus when it first you know uh, shaped itself or morphed itself into a life threatening disease there was a time when humanity did come together the kind of i i think that was a kind of a very uh, utopian phase the first phase but i think afterwards we just broke down into hordes of fear and we started uh, positioning ourselves into camps and communities and i i am sure we understand right i i i was just trying to give you the idea of what italy you know where there was this factor of the other so it was the other who was supposed to be the super spreader the other who was supposed to bring the corona into the country wherein it was found out not to be so their own people were doing it uh, when it comes to india also i think in the beginning we did have a lot of uh, understanding and things were moving at a very positive uh, pace i should say but somewhere down the line the idea of the the other community being the super spreader also came into existence okay. uh, for various reasons okay I, i would not like to go into the politics of it but yeah. i think that's how the fear factor basically works look at what trump is doing yeah. you know look at what is happening in you know our neighboring country is also it even in a landlocked country like bhutan they felt that you know it was never the bhutanese who could you know spread this because they thought that they were very pure Yeah, yeah. They did not have this at all in them, so it was again the outsider, you know. Okay. So uh, the, it always happens when it yeah. is about a scare, when it is about a panic, it always happens. And if you are asking me about the future, the people are very good at forgetting. So I'm sure once all this gets over, like all those things, major things which we have forgotten today, absolutely erase out of our mind. I'm sure that would happen. in the near future also so I, i hope i have answered both the questions okay yeah. okay uh, so next question is in this post human world is tracing human subjectivity is possible or not i think this is the right time for us to sit down and ponder i think this is the right time because we have been hurt we have been wounded we have understood our own limitations we have understood in a sense our mortality We, are, we have understood that the human being can can die out. So I think this is the right time for us to sit down, ponder, be reticent, and probably think about you know embracing all our diversities and all our differences. But are we going to do that? I think the answer is basically up to us, to you and me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so next question is: uh, We turn out to be robots since years. but is it like now sapiens are most dangerous or uh, more competitive that is a very straight answer for that it's not now 
we have always been the most dangerous we have always been the most invasive we have always been the most destructive look around us we have killed off people whatever survived the semblance of survival here and there is what we are holding on to now but i think it's not a question of now it's a question of ever right from the beginning till the end remember homo sapiens became the most dominant species only after killing off the other homo you know variety which was existing side by side once we understood that they were there we killed them off we finished them off and that is how we came to be the dominant species in this world and today again if anything erupts and anything appears to be dangerous to us we would definitely finish it off so yeah we are the most dangerous no doubt about it yeah uh, another question is how is post humanism different from classical humanism classical humanism is where you give centrality to the human you say that the world was created for us you say that the world is for us you say that we are the caretakers of the world that is humanism mm-hmm. See, humanity always has this this idea of the burden you always think that you are responsible for everything so whether it is the white man's burden or you know it the american imperialist burden or you know the way you think that you have to take care of nature or you think that you have to take care of the flora and the fauna it's always about you so humanism classical humanism basically focused only on us but post humanism would like to talk about a world which has evolved beyond us maybe even without us or maybe with just a, a hybrid of us so wherein the human is not central the human is not the be all and end all the human is just one of the fringes that populate in the margins of what we would call the world and society i think that is the basic difference between humanism and post humanism okay uh, so next question is as humans are post human what role does ethic play in the post human discourses what exactly are ethics yeah ethics ethics are ethics are rules which have been made up by you and me right it it it's a moral code a moral unwritten code which you use as a kind of a parameter which is probably something that fits you into society or something that takes you away from society right so sometimes the ethic might be the dress that i wear sometimes the ethic might be that you know i don't go and hunt in let's say the summer i just go and hunt in the winter sometimes my ethic say that okay you know out of 12 months only 3 months would be given for bail hunting the rest 9 months we let them you know flourish when you talk about ethics you will understand that every ethic has an agenda that ethic is used to keep you in some way or the other in a pedestal that is of oppression in a pedestal that is of a kind of a passive aggressive force force that keeps you down Uh, see, basically, we use use ethics to say to our children that okay, this is what you have to do, this is what you have not to do. So, right from you know from our childhood, we have been brought up in the whole idea of ethics, which kind of morphs and changes as and when we grow. Yeah. Ethics is man-made. So, if humanism. evolve into post humanism we also need to talk about an idea of a post ethic also in post humanism okay. uh thank you sir for these answers and we are limiting here for the questions uh due to time constraint uh now it was uh, actually a brilliant and wonderful session uh the question of 2020 anas horribilis it was very original Uh, writing in indigenous time and the survival of human being is very well justified and the way you deliberated on the galapagos syndrome the idea of essence and the notion of human is quite relevant and highly important in today's era of pandemic and how apocalypse is staring at human beings your remark on exotic monsters like frankenstein created by us put forth a real debate the post human can be more than human 
how pandemic is going to exist in our mind and ultimately in our lives the idea of cyber anxiety and the age of fomo a uh, gaze at the beautiful world and how the beauty is converted to zulu cost and equated to holocaust uh, here i would like to add that holocaust is being repeated Uh, so your overall presentation was incisive genius and deductive uh, i i really i thanks to i thank to you and uh, i thank the participants who have asked the brilliant questions uh, and uh, to you uh, dr jana for the convincing replies to those questions i once again thank to dr dinesh nayar and dr jana for bestowing on us such a wonderful experience <coughs> Now I invite Mrs. Uh, Soma Banerjee to give concluding remarks and propose the formal vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Banerjee. What a splendid! It has indeed been a pleasure for all of us to have Dr. Dinesh Kumar Nair. and dr abdul mohammad ali jinnah with us your talks have generated so much of curiosity and excitement as it is evident from the number of questions posed by the participants in the chat box as well as the praises for your wonderful discourses from dr nair's sweeping talk on the biocultural agenda of pandemic we recognize how important it is to make the ecological concern central in the everyday lives of teachers and students as well as the larger environmental movements across the globe be the change you want to see in the world said gandhi and i am sure we shall spare no efforts in putting theory into praxis friends in the context of a pandemic perilled world we must work out an ecologically grounded epistemology which can considerably restore the balance between us and all the things in nature including microbes and pathogens there is a dire need to persuade convince and push through a non negotiable agenda one that rises over the politics of vote banks and expediency to restore normalcy to our times by normalcy i mean simply going about our lives the way we used to especially to walk into our classrooms and be with our students in an environment where the mind is without fear dr nair has made us understand that we need to rethink and reconfigure our organic relationship with nature climate and the planet so that our future and the future of our students fulfills the promise of social justice and global peace from dr abdul's thought provoking talk on post humanism we understand how important it is to keep intact our essential humanity even as our cells are increasingly getting getting intervened altered and mutated by the artificial intelligence robotics and the information technologies of a cybernetic world in a networked society where more and more things we do are becoming virtual and online there is a greater need to reconnect not only with ourselves but also with each other thank you dr abdul for showing us what must remain humane in the post human i am immensely grateful to both dr nair and dr abdul for having accepted our invitation and making this webinar a grand success i extend my gratitude to dr katie thomas principal of our college for guiding and exhorting us to achieve the impossible even in these difficult times he gives us the strength and motivates us to excel in all our endeavors this webinar would not have seen the light of day had it not been for his constant support and inspiration i would like to thank my department colleagues dr sebi joseph and mrs baljeet mudaliar for their constant support at every stage in planning the webinar a special thank you goes to my teacher colleagues who have worked tirelessly right from day 1 to put together the various technical aspects involved in conducting an online webinar so i take this opportunity to thank mr bhushan mr rojo john mr amal pimpalkal reshma surabhi and ritika i would also like to thank bosco a member of the office staff for his much needed help 
I extend my heartfelt gratitude to all the participants of the webinar for their active participation in this intellectual feast. Together, we will build a better tomorrow. And without you, no webinar would be complete. Thank you. Once, once again, I thank one and all. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, sir.